ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is John Milestone. Uh, my job is to safely navigate the seas of teenage hormonal imbalance. Yes, I am a high school English teacher. I would like to let you all know that I'm the living embodiment of my speech right now. My hands are shaking, chest is getting tight, doubts are entering my mind. Pretty much I'm freaking out. Not really sure why I'm freaking out, but maybe it's because I'm worried about letting down my students, my colleagues, my family, anybody who's of any importance to me. It's making me feel silly. It's making me feel stupid. It's making me feel not valid. There's nothing I can do about these feelings. So just try to bottle them up on the inside, hold them tight. Maybe I'll get through this. Maybe. Breathe. Tell the shoulders to release. Tell the hands to stop shaking. Breathe. Today I'd like to talk to you about how do we avoid our human breaking point, okay? Um, Melise has references to it. Can we just state that the human breaking point is the loss of our young men and women? These young men and women who do not feel good enough, do not feel valued enough. They might be smart, they might be seen as intelligent, but still take their own lives. I, I surmise that this is actually a self-fulfilling prophecy. This is something that society, culture, we as teachers, you as students, all somehow come to, even with parents, society, everything. To calm myself down, all right. I like stories, do you like stories? Okay, let me tell you how I came to Turkey. Um, I had been lecturing in universities for about 10 years, and I decided that maybe I should try to get to them younger. I had these early impressions of Turkey when I walked in. I was confronted by two types of students. We have the angry, aggressive student. Teacher, I don't understand, explain it to me. You explain it, you explain it. They're so angry, they're not even listening, they're just mad they don't get it. And we have our other kind of student over here, the shy one, the one that's buried in the books, the ones that's afraid to ask questions. I was always taught, and I went to high school, like most of you, that the teacher was the authority. Okay, we are the ruler. It is us versus them. They will listen to us. They will do everything we tell them to do. Everything. They will not question us. Our word is infinite. That is it. I say something, you learn it, you do it. Us versus them. Upon actually getting in and putting my hands on this, I realized certain things that while these students were giving me a hard time, they were actually trying to learn. It was just the fact that it was me in the classroom, pretending I was the authority figure. So what do I do? I decide, look, I have this one class. I decide that this is the class I'm going to take the jump in. I decide, OK, let's relax the, re the authority role. Let's put on a hat. Great for me. It covers my male pattern baldness. Yeah? How about I loosen the tie a little bit? How about I untuck the shirt? Will this make them more comfortable? And I found something magical. They started getting comfortable. They started asking questions. But it still wasn't good enough. There was too much tension in the air. And then one day, I, I don't really know. I just had enough. And there's this brilliant young woman. This, she writes like no one else you've ever read in your life. Will not speak a word. So I decide, just like animals in the animal kingdom, I'm gonna plop down on the floor right next to her, and I'm not gonna move until she speaks. We actually had a talk for about a half an hour that day. Hey, AAA. Um, and then also in their writing styles and all these other kind of things that came out with them. Uh, they, were, they were allowed to be weird. They started being themselves. They started being more comfortable. They weren't anxious. It was a beautiful thing. But it wasn't enough. Because every class would start, I had to deal with things such as the math test, the physics test, right? The chemistry test. Anyone who's been a teacher knows all the tests are there. How are they going to focus on your lesson when they have to study for 75 other lessons at the same time? So I started reading this guy, Daniel Kahneman. He started talking about thinking fast and slow, all right? And I just wanted to make my lessons more digestible so that I didn't stress them out anymore. We have this thing that's called the burden of instantly holding memory. Young men and women out there, how many times have you been in a classroom and you're actually paying attention and you're trying to learn and then immediately the teacher's in your face going, you understand, right? You get it, right? And what happens to you? 
anxiety creeps in. Because you haven't had time to think about it. The pathways in your brain haven't really caught it. You might get it if the teacher would just back away. There's something that's called booing, bullying in the intuitive mind. This sets you at a roll, ladies and gentlemen, where the intuition of your mind is that the teacher is demanding things of you that you can't learn right now. So therefore, your reason and your intuition fight against each other. I'll get to this in a second. And once again, you're going to see this increases anxiety. Let me show you exactly how this functions, OK? Next slide. OK. Intuition versus reason. Now, in your minds are very slowly. I, I, I took this from his book, just so you know. Um, we have two columns here. We have a column on the left and a column on the right. First, which ones are big letters and which ones are made out of small letters? You ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Were you able to do it? Pretty easy, right? Big little, big little. Now, which side of the column are they on? Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. A little bit slower. It's a little bit slower. Because your mind, your mind sees it on the right side, but wants to say the left. This is your intuitive mind. OK? The, these, these things from culture that we've grown up believing about education in a classroom environment, if we change them, it, it builds your anxiety, and it makes it harder for you to learn. In his book, he talks about mental arithmetic is a very voluntary activity that requires effort and should not be formed while taking a left turn and is associated with dilated pupils and accelerated heart. Panic! Or don't do math while driving a car. Okay? Intuition, when you're driving a car, you just know how to drive a car. You don't have to think about it when you're riding a bike. But then if you start thinking about math, ooh, that's tough. Or for some of you, when you're taking a language lesson and you don't understand everything that's being spoken to you, now it's panic time. Now you can't get it. You're not letting yourself get it. You're getting negative, right? You get anxious and you get negative. Does this not sound, teachers, like every 15 and 16-year-old you've ever met in your life? Right? Frustrated? Negative. Let's find out why, shall we? OK. The first step that you go through is something called the noisy brain. It's actually an engineering term for noisy engines. This is when you have so much going on in your brain at one time, you can't focus on the thing in the middle. right? Just like an engine, if everything else is burr all around the engine, you can't focus on the engine itself. This is what happens to you. You're thinking in, during a lesson. Your mind is wandering. Maybe you're bored. I don't know. Um, you're thinking about your boyfriend, your girlfriend, texting. Oh, you've got a math test coming up, and you hate the physics teacher that's coming up after that. Oh, God, we all hate the physics teacher, don't we? Um, and so therefore, you have so much focus. You have so much information coming in at one time, you can't focus on the thing you need to. And this causes one of my favorite terms that I've found since I started researching this. Cognitive overload. It sounds like a monster truck rally. Friday, 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 live. Cognitive overload. Cognitive overload occurs with you guys. The more information you are given, the harder is it for a person to focus. And remember, which increases anxiety, making studying not effective. This is when you wait until the last minute to do that essay that was due for two weeks. And it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and you can't remember the words, right? Because you've got to get the essay done, because physics test is tomorrow, and then the math test comes, and then the chemistry test comes, and oh my god, I'm freaking out. I can't focus on anything. It's all one thing. This is actually uh, John Swaller coined this term. So what do we do? This whole thing, for, for those of you who have studied biology, um, this is actually working in terms of the brain as well. This is what you have triggered students and teachers. Because remember, with cognitive overload, the students aren't doing what we want them to do. So guess what we do? We get mad. We discipline. We assign more homework. We give more quizzes. That'll teach them. Now they'll do their work. 
If we just give them more work, then they'll do all the work. They haven't done anything, but more is better than nothing, right? So anyway, the sympathetic part of the mind is the fight or flight response. It causes dilated pupil, shaking, rapid heartbeat and breathing, uh, pale or flushed skin. All the blood runs from our brains to our body parts. What's the one thing that we need for our brains to work? Oxygen? Where's the oxygen going? Away? <sighs> this is what we're putting ourselves into. I get angry at a student, the student gets angry at me, or frustrated or scared or whatever. Remember at the beginning, all the people I was gonna let down? That's constantly in a student's mind. They're always worried that they're gonna let down their parents. Your good students who are focusing and trying really hard, they wanna please their parents, they wanna please their teachers, they wanna please their friends, right? They're afraid of the models of success that Melise was just talking about. The idea that they have to be perfect, or you won't love them or we won't love them as teachers, or we won't respect them. We are literally putting them in a fight or flight response, which decreases learning by like 90%. They can't study when they're anxious. What we have to do is get them in the parasympathetic mode, which is relaxed, being able to breathe, being able to learn, being able to ask questions. Without them being able to ask questions, what the hell are we doing here, teachers? Right? Give me all the questions. I don't care if they're stupid or not. They're fun. Thanks. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the biology of this and how this actually comes to be, which is actually kind of crazy. When I read it, I had my aha moment. Oh my God, what have I been doing to these kids? This is a great book, read it, do it. Uh, <laughs> the immediate required understanding triggers a sympathetic mode, ah, sympathetic mode of the mind or we have failed. And this is what I was getting to earlier. When the, when the student is panicked, and we're requiring them to understand now, you do it now, I'm the authority, right? I told you to learn it, why don't you know it? We have failed, the teacher and the student, because they learned nothing, absolutely nothing. If we get in a little bit of the neuroplasticity of the brain, um, the reason why this doesn't work is because Teenagers' brains are still forming. New pathways in the brain haven't come yet. So we're asking them to remember something that we're teaching them now, and they haven't even had a chance to think about it. If we just backed off for five minutes or maybe a day, and they thought about it, probably put it in their brain. This is the big thing. In the brain, there is this place called the amygdala. This is where all your emotions are locked. What they're finding in teenagers right now is that th this part controls the negativity portions of the mind, it causes the anxiety portion of the mind. When we make our students anxious, it actually grows. It eats the happiness centers and builds highways to the cerebral cortex, meaning their normal state of mind is anxious. It's not relaxed, it's anxious. They go to bed anxious, they wake up anxious. We are inhibiting their ability to learn. Anxiety becomes the normal, the normal state of rest. This is the same thing that happens with people who have chronic pain. Their arm is, their shoulder's been hurt for, I don't know, two years. They get a surgery, it fixes it. There's no more pain, but the brain tells them there's pain. It's called phantom pain. Meaning their normal state of mind is anxious. It's not relaxed, it's anxious. They go to bed anxious, they wake up anxious. We are inhibiting their ability to learn. Anxiety, okay. Teacher gave me a presentation. Oh my God, I don't wanna do it. I am so afraid, I can't do it. I have stayed up all night long trying to do my presentation and I still can't do it. I am out of my mind, I can't focus on anything anymore, I don't even know I'm holding a flower. I can't do it, then I fail. From the beginning to the end, you have created your own destiny. And this is how it functions. So, <laughs> the last thing I have for you here, 
Uh, it's this interesting theory uh, by a physics man, uh, man of physics uh, who also started to study neuroscience. It's actually called fun functional integration. Okay, functional integration is trying to teach students how they're learning, why they're learning, and what's going on with them. Uh, the goal is for the pupil to become able to function well, regardless of any underlying structural problem, and for the mind and all body parts to find a new integrated way to function together. All this means is, remember the highways I was talking about from the emotional part to the cortex? If you focus on them and you tell your body to calm down, it will. So we have to teach students, <laughs> you look anxious, maybe you should breathe right now. Get that oxygen back to your body. Get that oxygen back to your brain. And you know what? Once you relax, just maybe, maybe we'll be able to talk and you'll be able to learn again. This is what I was talking about. It's called emotional and cognitive awareness. Um, these young men and women, they, <laughs> they're living to test. They're, they're living not day to day, but literally test to test. And as Melise was saying about you know, the three professions in Turkey, we know those, right? Doctor, lawyer, engineer. If you're not that, you're a failure, children. We have to let them know it's okay. It's okay to study literature. Look, we have to tell them that it's not, you have control of your minds, but, you, sorry, you have your control of your lives, but your minds and your bodies as well. If you get nervous, take a moment, put down the damn math book and breathe. Maslow called it, I don't like his period of motivation, but anyway, he had a step seven, and it was called self-actualization. Self-actualization means that you're actually aware of where you are in the world, and you can focus on how to make yourselves better. Better doesn't mean points. It doesn't mean 100 on a test. Better means you understand something better than you did yesterday. You have to learn problem solving through failure. There's this idea out in the world that the people that Melise was talking about once again, they've never failed in their lives, so they don't know how to solve anything. And hopefully, one more, I'm almost done. Subdue, we have to subdue the human propensity for self-destruction. Hopefully by doing this, we won't lose more men, young men and women that we need. We need smart, capable young men and women. Okay, last one, sorry. <laughs> Okay, and this is, this is just for teachers and, and students and parents and their kids as well. Uh, yeah, we went on a Churchill bench. Uh, courage is what it takes to stand up and speak, but courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. That's what we have to do with our students. We have to be able to listen to them. As parents, you have to be able to listen to your kids, and then hopefully, hopefully, they will listen to us. Thank you.